Thank you so much, Pastor Randy. You know, after all of that, I better be a good speaker, right? <coughs> I'm always wondering when people give these kinds of introductions, especially one where we know each other, we love each other from families I know, the Diatos, right? And Rudy back there, at Ticelli, right? You, you know, we have this history, and it reminds me how old I am now already, right? What I love about this church is there's so many young people. I was watching those kids playing instruments. Yeah. Like, amazing. Praise wow. God. You have a great, great legacy that you're building. So praise God for that. Praise God for you, Pastor Randy. And know God is building through you this wonderful legacy to continue his work here on earth. An apologist, by the way, is not someone who says sorry very often, right, because they're good Canadians. It's someone who gives good reasons for the hope that we have. And it go, goes back right from 1 Peter 3.15, where Peter says, we are to be people who give, who are always prepared to give good reasons for the hope that we have. And this morning, I want to give you some tools to think about, because I can promise you this, things will not get easier in Canada for Christians. And we need to be prepared, not out of fear, not out of worry, but because we have good news to share. Amen. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what I love the name of this church. You are followers of Christ because he gave us the best news of all. Right, that God had come down to share a message of reconciliation. We can restore, have a, our relationship with God restored. And we can be at peace with our maker. That's the good news that we share. And see, that's the challenge now as we move towards a culture that doesn't agree with us. I want to go back a little further than our, our time here in Winnipeg to June 6, 1944. That was D-Day. It was when 156,000 Allied soldiers got, went on 6,900 boats to go land on the beaches of France near Normandy to liberate Nazi-occupied Europe. And if you know what happened, it was one of the bloodiest days in World War II. But it was so necessary because if they weren't going to do that, all of Europe would fall under an evil occupation they would not find freedom. And when we think about that day, I remember one of the, the articles I read pointed out that this movie called Saving Private Ryan had some of the most realistic views of what happened that day. Who's seen that movie before? Okay, a few of you. So you know it's hard to see. It's bloody. It's very difficult. And I give you that warning now. Right? If you want to, don't want to see it, just close your eyes. You're welcome to not look at it. But I want to show it to you because I want us to go back to that time, to place ourselves with those soldiers landing on the beaches of Normandy. By the way, most of these soldiers were between 18 and 25 years old. So young. And yet here they were, ready and willing to give up their lives to liberate the land. By the way, when you see this, you'll see that many times the boats would come, they wouldn't even land on the beach, they'd land on a sandbar that were meters away still from the beach. So they would have to swim to that beach. And by the way, they're carrying 50 pound bags, backpacks. And when they would land in the water, they would land in the water, they'd go, of course, they'll start sinking. So they would have to take out their bags, take out all their kit, swim as they're dodging all these bullets and bombs coming. And by the time they reach the beach, guess what? Their gun is already waterlogged. They have to try to find another weapon to use when they get there. And, 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 and not only that, sometimes their equipment, if they didn't put it on properly, would be harmful. If they actually put their helmet on in the wrong way, they put the strap on like this, and when they land on the water, it would actually snap their neck and kill them. All the possible dangers were going on to these men, yet they risked their lives. This is what it looked like. Oops. Oh, one more time. Get the sound as well, please. To ask you a question, as you're thinking about that day, as you're thinking about those men coming into that battlefield, 
Who were the bravest soldiers on D-Day? Who were the bravest soldiers on D-Day? And was it those who were coming on the beach? Was it those on the boat? Who do you think were the bravest soldiers to fight that day? I want us to think about this and think about what that, that whole day was like at church of all places, because we cannot forget that we are at war. Do you know that? If you're a Christian, you're in battle. And it's not me exaggerating that or making this up. This is God's word himself saying this. God's word itself saying this. In Ephesians, Paul writes, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. We're in spiritual warfare, ladies and gentlemen. And sometimes when we've been in church and the church is growing and it's, you know, it's led by a godly people and it's very safe and comfortable. And yes, all of those are good things. There's nothing wrong with that. But then we sometimes get so comfortable and complacent that we forget we're still at war. We have an enemy that hates the gospel so much. It will do everything it can to prevent God's people from sharing that good news to the people who need to be liberated, just like Nazi-occupied Europe. And when you send your students and your young people, the ones who are on the stage, to go to university or college or even high school now, do you know 80% of Christian kids who go to church by the time they reach university or college, drop out of church and start calling themselves not Christian anymore. Do you know that? Are you preparing your young people for that onslaught? To know how awful the world has become and hostile to the Christian worldview. And remember, I'm not talking about the people. The people are the victims. They're the ones who are being enslaved. It's the spiritual forces that are lying to them, that are telling them that they don't have to believe in God, that there is no God. I just talked recently recently to one of my good friends who she grew up in the church and she's now a radical atheist. She's telling me all kinds of things about how I should believe like her. She's evangelizing for her view. And she's telling me that her life is still miserable and awful and I can't help but let her know isn't that because your worldview what you believe still does not match reality it's still not true because that's what this warfare is all about that's what spiritual war is about my friend and mentor Greg Kokel actually wrote a book and I have copies if you're interested it's a really good book called the story of reality and in this book he says something very plain He says, the reason why we should be Christians is because the Christian worldview explains how reality works. Christianity, he says, is the story of reality. Sorry, I just jumped a little ahead there. Christianity is the true story of reality, explains how reality actually is. And so many times as Christians, we forget, don't we, that this is not just a religion. This is not just a way of life for us. This is not just where we come because our friends are here. All of those things can be true. But we are here because there was a man who came to earth 2,000 years ago. We are celebrating his birth, right? And that man grew up. He claimed to be God. He died and rose again and proved that he was God. And he's coming back. And the Christian message is to proclaim that story of reality until he returns. That's what we believe, ladies and gentlemen. And all of reality hinges on him, not on us. See, my atheist friend says, you should be able to do whatever you want. You should be able to decide what's right and wrong for you. You should sleep with whoever you want. You should believe whatever you want. Why? Because all of reality depends on who? Her himself. And we have a choice, don't we, to decide who is going to be the center of our reality, ourselves? Well, we know how weak and awful sometimes we are, don't we? 
or the God of the universe who actually knows everything because he made everything and who is the one who's capable of loving us despite everything we've done? Who do we want to be the center of our reality? Now, when I, let me explain to you. I think this is important. When I say something is true, I'm saying that this is what Jesus himself claimed to be. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, let me ask you, how many ways are there to Jesus? How many ways are there to Jesus? I thought there was a, a charismatic church. I thought you talked a lot, right? Is that okay? <laughs> now, you, you feel free to answer, okay? Was any, anyone want to say, well, how many ways are there to Jesus? There's many ways to Jesus, right? You can come as a young person. You can come as an old person. You can convert through university or apologetics, right? Or through music or prayer, all kinds of ways. But how many ways are there to God? According to Jesus, there's one way. He's the only way. And so when everybody else goes try saying, oh, that you can believe whatever you want, or you can just make yourself the source of reality, who are they actually disagreeing with? Jesus right? That's the whole point. He's the one who claims to be the center of reality. Oh, let me illustrate. I think this might be helpful. A few years ago, when I was still studying in Ottawa, we visited Montreal. My parents came, the ones who came in and shared with you. And that was their first time in Montreal. And I remember we had a great time. We were visiting downtown. Has anyone, by the way, visited Montreal before? Okay, a few of you, please go visit. It's beautiful. Actually, Quebec City even is better. You'll like it there. When we went to, to Montreal, we finished our trip. We started driving back to our hotel. And our hotel was somewhere near downtown. I think, I, I think it was somewhere easy to find. About 15 minutes into the drive, I realized, because I've been there before, and, and told my dad, we're going the wrong way. My dad's like, no, we'll just keep going. I promise. About 15 minutes later, my brother said, you know what? I think JoJo's right. I think we're going the wrong way. And my dad's like, no, let's just keep going a little further. About half an hour later, my mom's like, I think we're going the wrong way. My dad's like, no, just a little more. And then about 20 minutes after that, we were already on the outskirts of town. One more time here. And my dad finally said, let's, uh, let's turn around. I think we're going the wrong way. <laughs> and it's because we didn't have a good GPS at the time that told us where we ought to go. A global positioning system that helps us navigate the roads of Montreal. Right? And, and this is the point. The GPS tells us what reality is when it comes to the roads. Right? Over Thanksgiving, uh, Google Maps actually had a glitch. And the glitch said that there was a side road that people could take because there was so much traffic from people in BC coming to Alberta for the long weekend. And so a lot of people took this side road thinking it would be a shortcut. But instead, it was an old logging road. It was a dead end. So all these people who took the shortcut, guess what? They had to drive all the way back, go back into the traffic. It added hours to their trip. And how grateful do you think they'd be if there was someone standing on the side of the road saying, don't go this way, because if you go this way, you'll get lost. Right? Wouldn't you be grateful if that was you? Right? Wouldn't you be grateful if this was someone was willing to take the time to save you all of this energy, all of this time? It's worse when Apple created their mapping system. There are people who actually use their GPS because it was so broken and drove to places like a lake because they were following the Apple GPS. It was so bad, the CEO of Apple who made the mapping system was fired because their mapping system was terrible. And it, in fact, risked people's lives, right? So when we talk about having the story of reality under the right GPS, isn't that what we as Christians are supposed to do? To help people not get lost, right? Because God's positioning system, that, that's what we have. That's what we're supposed 
to be doing to make sure people don't just waste their time or waste their lives. They don't get lost forever for eternity. And as Christians, we have that job. In fact, that's why I define evangelism as an invitation to exchange a worldview focused on ourselves to a worldview that's centered on Christ. To help people not get lost by introducing them and inviting them to reality. Because if you don't have Jesus, what happens is you will live in contradiction to how reality actually is. And what you believe and your words, your ideas will not match the roads that we follow in life. Do you know that? That's why we exist as a church, to be that roadmap, to let people know how we ought to go, that Jesus is the way. When we, we want, want a, an example of that, I love, and there's no better story, of course, than scripture. And here is from Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 24. And what I like to do here is actually just show a video clip that shows word for word what the Bible says in this passage. So if you want to follow along, this is when Peter and the disciples get a chance to preach and minister in Jerusalem for the very first time. This is what the Holy Spirit has just come down on them. He's given them all kinds of languages to speak so that people could be saved, to hear the gospel. Yeah. And now they're given a chance to preach in front of all of Jerusalem as these people from everywhere in the Roman Empire had come to sacrifice at the temple. And I want you to pay very close attention to how they invite people to the story of reality. That was one of the first sermons, right, that the church gave to this pagan secular culture that was so evil it actually crucified God. Wasn't that powerful? Wasn't that so, such a loving, truthful fact that he did? The very people who killed Jesus are the very people he's proclaiming, you must do this so you can be saved. You can repent. What a gracious thing to do. I want to talk about four things that Peter did there in that sermon that we can practice in our everyday conversations. You see, the early church, they didn't have the, the beautiful buildings we have, the sound system, the worship team that we have. All they had was the love of Christ, and they knew the truth of the resurrection, and they shared it in everyday conversations. And as our culture gets worse, ladies and gentlemen, God has empowered all of us with all kinds of opportunities in our everyday life to talk to people about God. In, in fact, you don't have to be an apologist like me, though I think we should all be apologists in some sort, right? To defend good, give good reasons for the hope that we have. But, but we can do it with the people who God has placed around us, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, our classmates. A, a young woman came to me after one of my talks and she said, Jojo, I'm not like you, I'm not a good speaker, I'm very shy, I'm an introvert. How can I do this? And I said, well, do you have any friends who are introverts too? And she said, yes. And I said, do you think that she'd be more happy to talk to you, they'd be more happy to talk to you than they are to me? And she said, yes, well, that's the point. God has put these friends around you so you can talk to them, so you can show God's love to them. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the same with you. You have all of these great opportunities God has placed. Even something as simple as asking the waiter's name at the restaurant. Have you done that before? Not just the one with the name tag, you can guess that. So, so that you can treat this person, not just like the people who give you water, right? You can treat this person as a person. You may have opened up some spiritual doors with by just treating them like a human being. Oh, and by the way, and this is hard for me as an Ilocano, to make sure you leave a big tip, right? Because you want them to remember you, right? So one time I remember this lady, I asked her name, her name was Susan. And I said, hey, Susan, have you ever read a book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Because one of the characters there is named Susan. And it so happens I told her that this book is one of my favorite books. And she said, yeah, I love that book. So I said, do you know that the author of the book also wrote some other books saying that his Christian faith 
was worth believing because it was reasonable. There's good arguments for it. And she said, no, I never heard that before, but that sounds interesting. And I said, well, the book is called Mere Christianity. You should get a copy. Right? So all of that came out because I asked her name. Right? And this is the kind of stuff we can do in our everyday life. Right? So let, let me give you four more ideas as we think about these conversations, about how we can engage people around us. First, find some common ground. What did Paul, uh, Peter do in that story? He's talking to them as Jews. That's his people, right? That's his ethnicity. That's his tribe. I love my dad when he evangelizes as a Filipino pastor. What do you think his first question is going to be? Where are you from in the Philippines, right? It's very, very good because it's very a bonding, right? It's part of our, us who we are. And it's great. And he often, because he traveled for work, he, he worked for UP Los Manos in the Philippines, he would often be in some of these towns that people say they're from. So right away, there's common ground. When you think about what common ground means, it means we look for connection points in our relationships with people. What are some ways they're already connected that we have some common ground on? And start there. Maybe the same passion for sports or videos, video games or art or fashion or whatever. Those are great things. God has given us these interests, and that's good to talk about. In fact, often evangelism conversations talk, start with a question like this. How can we get someone to consider spiritual things, right? But the challenge with that is people are already facing spiritual things. And so I prefer to ask, what ways are they already discussing or facing those spiritual realities? And talk about those. I have befriended, get this, I have a friend. She's one of the most hardcore atheists in Calgary. In fact, she served with the International Humanist Association in the U.S., right, the first Canadian to do so. And, and I, I met her because we actually do debates all the time in Calgary to the point where we now we become friends, which is great. I just had coffee with her a couple months ago. And so one of the things that I do, though, when I listen to her is I point out the inconsistencies in her faith. Because if, if you're an atheist, you don't believe in God. You don't believe there's anything supernatural. Everything is only physical matter right? and only physical things. The problem with that is that's not true. For example, she actually goes regularly to the United Nations to speak out for human rights especially in Muslim countries that persecute gay, homosexual, and Christians even from these Muslim countries. You know what I tell her? That's good that you do that. I support you. Of course we should have human rights. Here's the problem. Where do human rights come from? If everything is just physical matter, isn't human rights, the idea of equality and treating people well, isn't that something that's not physical? That's immaterial, right? That's, that's not something that you can just touch and feel. That's a spiritual reality. Even the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms says rights come from God. Did you know that? So we can't escape that. If she's going to be fighting for human rights, she has to know where they come from. Who decides what is rights? Her? I don't think so. And by the way, she's never really answered that question. She just said, well, they just exist. Well, so what? The Muslims who are doing this think they're doing what's right. We think they're doing wrong. Who's to decide? Right? Only God can. That's the point. Another thing we can do is ask good questions in those conversations. We need to learn that sometimes we don't have to preach we can just ask some questions. You know, listen, when Peter was speaking, right, he's saying, why do you call, why do you call us drunk? Do you not know what's going on? Right, right from the start there, right? In the same way, we can ask questions about where these people are at, because again, their worldview consists of contradictions. Because what they believe, again, what? It doesn't match reality. They're lost, right? And we need to help them be found. So for example, here's a, a Facebook picture that I found, a meme. It says, 
The infallible word of God is edited, annotated, and written by man. Have you seen this before, some of you? Or heard of this idea? What are they saying? What is this picture saying? Right? That if the Bible is written by a man, and men make mistakes, therefore the Bible is full of what? Mistakes, right? Have you heard that argument before? They've, people like, try to justify all kinds of things like this. Yeah. Right? And they're trying to say, you Christians, you believe in a book that's full of mistakes because it's written by a man yeah. or written by men. What's the problem with that? Well, wasn't this picture also written by a man? Right? And if you can't trust anything written by a man because it's full of mistakes, doesn't that mean this is full of mistakes too? Isn't that a contradiction as well? You see the problem, right? And we can't be scared of these kinds of ideas because if this reality is God's reality, then our worldview will always match reality. You will not have contradictions to how the world is, but their views do. Let me show you another example. How about this one? When we, when we ask about this, by the way, there's all kinds of assumptions that people make. Right? And I want you to listen very carefully to this one or look very carefully at this one to think. I was talking to a young lady who was speak at a, a Catholic school, in fact. And at this Catholic school, she raised her hand and she said, you know, you're talking about all this religious stuff. Don't you know that's just your truth? Because there's no such thing as truth. Have you heard that before? It's only your truth or my truth, but there's no objective truth for everybody. Now, what is the assumption in that statement? What has this young lady assumed? Think about it. Isn't the assumption that her statement is true? Right? Doesn't she believe this is true? That's why she's telling me to believe it, right? What's the problem? She just said there's no such thing as truth. So how can that be? Do you see there's a contradiction there? And asking a good question will help reveal that. The question is this, is that true? And she said, uh, I'm not sure now, right? You see the issue, right? The Christian worldview makes sense. And we can reveal that by asking good questions. Let me give you a couple more. Well, oh, by the way, when someone says there's no such thing as truth, remember this sign. What does the sign say? There's nothing written in stone. What's the problem? It's written in stone. Exactly. It's just like the person who says there's no such thing as truth. So if anyone ever says that to you, remember this sign. Okay? Remember it's a contradiction. How yeah, about this one? Uh, I'm sorry, my clicker doesn't like to work here. Okay. There. Okay, this one, you've already seen it, but this one, I can't believe in Christianity because Christianity is so judgmental. Now, what's the assumption here? Think about the assumption. What are they assuming in this statement? Aren't they assuming that it's wrong to judge? Right? That's the assumption. Right? The problem is exactly, they are judging, aren't they? So if it's wrong to judge, why are they judging? Aren't they being judgmental? Absolutely. And so that's why you can ask, aren't you judging Christianity if it's wrong to judge? Right? You see the contradiction that's there. Last one. When someone says, don't force your views on me. I get this all the time when you talk about abortion or sexuality, especially when you talk about policy or law. I say, you shouldn't be forcing your religious views on people. How dare you do that? You should keep it to yourself. Now, what's the assumption? The assumption is the same. It's wrong to force your views on people, right? But what are they doing when they say the statements? Isn't this a view? And aren't they telling people to believe this view? They're telling you to believe this view, aren't they? So a good question to ask is a one or two word question. Why not? And every one of their responses will be their view that they're trying to impose on you when they say it's wrong to do that. 
You see, this works because, again, the Christian worldview makes sense. Our worldview is consistent with reality. So it's not going to contradict like the way the other worldviews do. My third point is that when we make claims, we have to make sure we have evidence for those claims. Remember Peter, when he's talking to the people in the crown? You know this Jesus. He was there. He died. And you know he rose again. The Christ you crucified has come back to life. What is he doing? He's using evidence. He's not just making a claim because it makes him feel better. He's not saying, believe this because you know what? It will help you become happy. What happened to Peter? He was crucified likely upside down. All right. In fact, one of the reasons why I believe my Bible is because the Bible often makes me feel really bad. Did you know that? And that's a good thing because that means I didn't write it. Right? It does not conform to me. It's not something that I like because I like it. It's something that's true and I have reasons for it. And the challenge that we have is we often let people make all kinds of claims without providing any reasons. That's why I ask, have they reasonably justified their claim when people talk to me in these conversations? One time I was at the University of Calgary and John, John 2, 14, I already talked about. I was at the University of Calgary and I was speaking about the claims of Christianity. And one of the things I mentioned was that Christianity is one of the few religions where its holy texts can actually show a way to disprove it. Did you know that? I haven't read every holy text, so I can't say for everything. But Christianity, the Christian Bible, actually shows a way that we can disprove the Christian faith. It goes back to what Paul says in Corinthians, that if Christ has not been raised, our faith is worthless. Do you know that? We can actually show that Christianity is false right from the scriptures. And what's wonderful is that we care so much about truth that we can actually say we've tested it and we know it isn't false. That's why we can share it with you today. So when someone comes to us to challenge us, we need to be able to show that they have to prove evidence too. <clears throat> a young man came to me in his white lab coat at the University of Calgary. And he was so proud of his coat, he came up to our pro-life display. He said, you religious people, you Christians, don't, you're always talking about your Bible and being true. Don't you know the only truth that exists is scientific truth? Who's heard that before? That science is the only truth. That's all over university, by the way, if you go there. Here's the problem. This statement is actually not a statement from science. This is a philosophical statement. And whatever you do, you cannot prove or justify this statement through science. It can only be proven through philosophy. So the question I asked him was this one. Can you prove that to me scientifically? And he paused, and it was like the longest 10 seconds in, our, in his life, right? That's what it felt like. And he looked at me and he said, no, I can't. And he looked down and he walked away. And I'm glad he walked away because I'm, I know that that conversation made him think helped him realize he was very arrogant for no reason. And the ideas that he gave did not match reality. It's like a man sitting on a branch who's cutting off that branch he's sitting on. When people talk about that, don't you realize science needs philosophy. It needs things that are not physical, like truth, like logic, like morality to do science. And all of those things, by the way, truth, logic, morality, come from God. We need God to do science. What's interesting, too, is when we face these kinds of things, we have to be, and that's the last point I want to make, we want to be ready to help the person and address that person's need and realize that it's not our job to save them. The Holy Spirit will save them, not us. But that doesn't mean we don't have a job to do. When I was in Israel, I got a chance to see uh, a, a, a village called Nazareth Village. It's a life-size village 
where you actually walk around, all the actors around are dressed like the time of Jesus. It's really powerful. And by the way, in 2024, in J January, we're going back to Israel to have an apologetics tour. We'd love to have you join us. We're doing both Egypt and Israel. There's nothing like being there where you walk on the, the stones where Jesus walked himself. It's amazing. But one of the things that I was able to see in Jerusalem, in this Nazareth village, there was a plot. So there was about a plot, maybe just a little bigger than the table here, a little longer, where the, there was good soil. And then beside it was a path, and then there was another plot for good soil for the neighbor. And then right beside that, there'd be a whole bunch of weeds or rocks on the side. And I thought, this is exactly what Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower, right? There's good soil, there's soil, that's, that there's, there's rocky soil, there's soil with, with weeds. And then I, I realized too, when these farmers are doing this, they're scattering seeds, and just like Jesus says, sometimes they land not on the good soil. And sometimes that's what we do too, when we talk about evangelism. We are scattering seeds, but sometimes, and I think for most Canadians, most times, what we need to do instead is till the soil. We need to prepare the soil first. And that means removing the rocks and the weeds that are preventing the seeds from growing in the first place. And that's why those conversations are so important. For example, I have two, two friends who came to me independently of each other and they said almost the same thing. They said, we work with people who know we're Christians, but they won't even talk to us about Jesus because they think we hate gay people. What do we do? What do we do? Well, we address that problem. And that's what we'll be doing after church today. We have to talk about sexuality and gender. And I know it's not easy. It's not something we want to talk about. The problem, especially parents and grandparents, your kids are already talking about this with someone else. And if they don't learn it from the church, they're going to learn it from someone else who does not follow God. So it's critical we have to have that conversation with them. And it's critical we need to understand the importance of what it means to be an ambassador for Christ. In fact, I, I, I think about what tilling the soil is and tilling the soil looks like. It's hard work, is it not? You need to keep pushing, pulling weeds because sometimes they keep coming back, yeah. right? Sometimes those rocks are heavy. But the only way to grow fruit is to make sure we do that work first. And there's a lot of that work that needs to be done. In fact, one of my favorite examples from Greg Kokel is that often our work is simply to put a pebble in someone's shoe. But have you ever had a pebble stuck in your shoe before? Who's had that pebble stuck in their shoe, right? All of us, I think, right? I remember I was driving from Calgary to Banff, and I realized about five minutes into the drive, I had a pebble stuck on my shoe. It was in the accelerator foot. So every time I sped up, I would be reminded how uncomfortable that was. And I tried. I tried to get it out while I'm driving at 100 kilometers, and that's not safe. It's not a, it doesn't work, right? Because it was right on the edge, too. And the, th the sad thing is it was a beautiful spring day, I remember, right? The, the trees were starting to bow. You can smell the fresh mountain air, right, from, from in Calgary, right? But guess what? I wasn't thinking about any of that. Guess what I was thinking about? stupid pebble in my shoe and guess what I did as soon as I got to my destination I threw off the rock of my shoe and got the rock out of my shoe right because that pebble was so annoying guess what sometimes God calls us to be annoying right sometimes God gives us a question or a thought or an argument or an idea that we can give to our friends and our co-workers so they can think about it even when they walk away and they're so annoyed, they want to think about Jesus. That's sometimes our job. We need to be prepared to do that job. In fact, as I mentioned, one of my favorite verses is 2 Corinthians 5.20. Notice what it says. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Whose job is it to be an ambassador? Whose job? Any hands? It's all of us, right? Because our job is to bring reconciliation. And notice, 
that job of being an ambassador is 24-7, all the time. Greg says you're an ambassador for Christ even if you're a bad one, good or bad. In fact, he says there's two reasons why people don't become Christians. The first is because they don't know any Christians. The second is because they know too many Christians. You know what I'm talking about. And we need to be good ambassadors regardless of where we're at, who we're speaking to, because we're always representing Christ. And the good news is because this is God's reality, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world that belongs to him and everything points back to him. That's what I realized when I was debating Christine, right, the atheist. A friend of ours, mutual friend, he's actually a professor of religion at the University of Calgary. And he was given the class, something called Atheism 101. And he said, okay, I'm gonna teach atheism, but he's a Christian. So instead he said, why don't I get a real life atheist to come and speak, and a real life theist to come and speak, and then we'll have a third class where they debate. And we had to debate in front of 60 atheists, mostly atheist students. And so Christine went first, she gave her arguments, and at the end of her presentation, a young woman raised her hand right in the middle of the, the, the front of the, the uh, auditorium, and she said, it's obvious, the more educated you are, the less religious you become. And you could see the other students were nodding their heads, saying, yeah, you're right. And so when I was going to speak the following week, I was praying, what do I say? Well, how do I respond? How do I help these students? How do I put the pebble in the shoe there so they can think about the Christian faith? And so I, I began to Google, and the Holy Spirit gave me a chance to look at the University of Calgary's shield or motto. And this is what it is. You notice it's a cow, because we're a Calgary, right? Of course, we like cows. And then there's this Welsh Gaelic saying on the bottom. I'm like, well, that's interesting. What is that from? And I realized it's everywhere on campus, on arches, on buildings. And, and, and it was actually a translation from Welsh Gaelic. And do you know what it says on that phrase? It says, I will lift up my eyes. That's the motto of the university. Does that sound familiar? Where is that from? I looked it up. It's from Psalms 121, verse 1. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. This university students who think they're so smart because they're not religious, and you religious people are so stupid, go to a university with a Bible verse as its motto. And when I pointed this out to the students at that eight class of atheism, you could hear a pin drop. There was no one able to respond. And when we were finally got a, got a chance to debate in our third class, you know what happened? Almost all of the questions were from the students were for the atheists, not to me, because they didn't know how to respond to truth. They were thinking about it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what we have. We have reality. All reality testifies to God's existence. We don't have to be scared about these ideas that are around us. We can engage them as God's ambassadors in everyday conversations. So let me go back. So I wrap up here and ask that question that I started with. And, and feel free, please raise your hand, okay, if you have an answer. Who do you think were the bravest soldiers on D-Day? Who do you think were the bravest soldiers on D-Day? Any thoughts? Huh? Uh, you know, Ryan, yeah, no, he, was, he wasn't on D-Day, though. He was already somewhere else, right? Who do you think were the bravest? I think the bravest soldiers on D-Day were those soldiers who came from the second wave, who saw the first wave being destroyed. 80% of them died that day, that hour. But they went to fight anyway. They went and did their job anyway. Because they knew that the people of Europe needed them so they no longer would be slaves. 
Ladies and gentlemen, that's us. We see what happened in the Bible. We see what happened in the history of Christians who stood up against great evil. Many of them lost their lives. And you know what? We may be at a time when that's going to happen again. But I encourage you, I challenge you to think about the mandate that we have. That regardless of the cost, we are called to be brave. Because that's what God did for us. Jesus faced that cross so we could be free. And now we have the job to do what he gave us to do, to be the salt and light, to be those ambassadors. So now we can bring good news to the people of Canada. That's our job. And that's the, my prayer for you and this church to continue to be followers of Christ. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this chance. Despite all of the, the weaknesses, all of the times we fail you, God, you always do what's right. And you always call us to do what's right. And you always are giving us the privilege to show your love to those around us. So God, give us a heart to remind us that Christianity is not just something we do on Sunday morning. It is the story of reality. Yeah. And that we are called to invite people to live in your reality, to have a real relationship with a real God. And we pray this in Jesus' name.